morning, everybody. Uh, let's read a quick psalm before we get started. We're going to praise the Lord this morning. Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his glorious works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouths. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Lord, we have come here this morning to seek your face and to recall all of the wonderful things that you've done, not just throughout history, times before us, Lord, but also in our own lives. And we just ask that you would prepare our hearts as we offer up these songs of praise and worship to you. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see your smiling faces this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who we worship the God forevermore will be. We opened the prison doors, parted the raging sea. My God holds the victory. Destroy in the house of the Lord, destroy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. I've got a surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who hears. We sing to the God who saves. Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy. Won't be quiet. 
out at your face Good morning, church. How are we doing? How are we doing? <laughs> Praise God. Praise Jesus. This next one is called In Christ Alone. So sing along if you know the words. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving seems My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand Jesus. Father, kindness, you have poured out of grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, oh my help in time of need. Lord, I 
Thank you so much for what you did on Calvary and the cross for us. We're grateful and give thanks that we can praise you this morning. Thank you for hearing our prayers and our worship.
Hello, hello. There we go. Okay, everybody. Let's see. There we go. Thank you, Eden, for opening up for us today. Appreciate that. We're gonna get ourselves going here. Got a very special word for today. Pretty excited about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do want that. Check it out. <laughs> I got some really fun stuff recently, unfortunately and fortunately. This is as bright as it's going to get, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, look at you. Welcome Good aboard, morning. Mandy. Thank you, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Let's get this show on the road. Let's get this boat launched. Pretty excited to be here today. What a beautiful day, huh? Unbelievable. Feels so much like spring right now in sunny Southern California, Redondo Beach, April 7th. Yeah. I want to talk to us, We're continuing with a look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just talking to the TV audience, okay? Yeah, the balcony. Yeah, I know. Whatever goes on here. Hello, all of you who are watching online. Welcome to the Breakwater Mega Church. This place will settle down, but in the meantime, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> Could tell a couple jokes or something like that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, we have fun together. We love each other. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going anywhere. Love Sundays, don't you? They uh, come rather quickly, though, don't they? <laughs> Why didn't we just did this? <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've been celebrating the Easter season, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All in favor? Come on. Yeah, we're here. Now, we are a part of what is called the Western Church, which is Catholics, Protestants, Pentecostals, Evangelicals, things like that. And for us, Easter falls on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. Weird. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was decided 1,700 years ago. Anyway... This calculation in the Western Church was based on the Gregorian calendar. Now, the Gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582 by uh, Gregory the Great. Let's see if I can get this on. That would help. It works so much better when it's on. Did you know that? So the Eastern Church, uh, Easter falls on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the Jewish Passover. <laughs> So their calculation is based on the Julian calendar, which was introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, which means they can't be right. I mean, come on, they use sundials, 46 <laughs> BC. <laughs> anyway, all that to say is that the Eastern churches are celebrating their Easter May 5th this year. So we can still celebrate Easter with the e with uh, the eastern side of the church. You're talking about Greeks, Russians, Bulgarians, Ukrainians, Syrians, Armenians, Coptic, you know, that whole side over there. There's, there's lots of them in our Christian family. So they're just beginning their Lent season. And so uh, it's exciting just to say. 
So next year, believe it or not, we'll all celebrate Easter on the same day. It's a rare event, which I think will be pretty spectacular, don't you? The whole world celebrating Easter all at the same time. So last Easter, I mean last Easter, last Sunday, look at that, so many icons, so many good stuff. Uh, we looked at a number of the best arguments against the resurrection, the most popular ones anyway, and they're pathetic. It's like, that's your best shot. That's, that's all you got. That's like nothing. Uh, it's, all of these theories are based on our extremely limited and primitive human knowledge. How much do we know about anything? You understand what I'm saying? A hundred years from now, look back at us like dark ages. Just like we look back in the 1950s. Huh? There were no TVs. What? No cell phones, no computers. What an age we live in, all right? And with AI and all the stuff that's going on right now, and with the James Webb Space Telescope getting information from the beginning of time, it's gonna dwarf any possible understanding of what can really happen in the universe as we know it. So, uh, our knowledge is like the straw man and the Wizard of Oz, remember that? He got his diploma. And you think about it, wow, what's a diploma? What is a diploma? It's a piece of paper. <laughs> you can get all the diplomas in the world, get as many as you can, store them up, because with inflation the way it is and the way the costs are rising, you might be able to use it for TP, <laughs> other things. Now, one of the substantial reasons for the historicity of the resurrection is called the criterion of embarrassment. So for those of you from Venice, this is based on the premise that if a story or detail is recorded in the New Testament, would be embarrassing or would be problematic for Christians of that day and age, it's more likely to be historically accurate. There's been a lot of study done on this, evidence for the resurrection by the heavy lifters for decades now. William Lane Craig, if you can find him online, which is pretty easy to do, listen to everything he has to say, N.T. Wright. It's so amazing because back in the dark ages in the 1900s that you had to read things in books. That was the only way to get information. And you had to actually read things. Now you can just YouTube stuff and listen to it all day long from guys that you have to spend a lot of money to go to class with, okay? You can sit down with C.S. Lewis and just go, are you kidding me? I'm not paying for this? It's incredible. Uh, Michael Lacona, uh, J.P. Moreland, I already mentioned him, and Kurt Dolan and many others. That's what I'm saying. So the point of this is, why would the gospel writers invent, fabricate, or incorporate unnecessary details into the gospel record if it was going to be a source of embarrassment or a complicate issues for them, or if it's going to be false or questionable? If I'm going to create a false religion, if I'm going to create a legend and myth, to propagate my culture, I wouldn't put unnecessary uh, obstacles in the way of believing that. Does, does that make sense to anybody? So there's certain elements, details in the resurrection accounts and four gospels that would have been glaring, awkward, very uncomfortable for Christians of those days, unless they were true. Now, one of the most important doctrines and teachings and foundations of all things Christian is the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, we've read it over and over again in the scriptures, that nothing else matters. It's all empty. It's false. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. You know, I don't feel like what I'm doing is useless because of the resurrection. I don't feel like our efforts in Africa and different parts of the world are useless because we understand and believe in the resurrection. But if there was no resurrection, no resurrection power, no ability to change lives and redirect you, then your faith is useless, and we're false witnesses about God because t we testify about God that he, Jesus is raised from the dead. So what do we have here in the resurrection? An extremely important foundational cornerstone of everything 
that is Christian, and ultimately it's the proof of the unique claims of Jesus Christ. It's the crown jewel, we'll call it, of all Christian truth. So Jesus makes outstanding claims, which for a normal person would be ridiculous and would be lunacy. But because he backs it up with the resurrection from the dead, we go, okay, everything else is true. <laughs> everything else fits together in the prophecies of the Bible and the future of the world. And so the evidence for the resurrection is very important. It's enormous value. And how important is it to you to get the best possible information on that? We would want eyewitness accounts, wouldn't you? Yeah. I would only want eyewitness accounts. I don't want to hear from anybody else. I, you know, I don't want to hear secondhand, thirdhand. I want to hear from people who were there. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who saw Jesus after his resurrection for 40 days. He taught them about the kingdom of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He instructed them about the law and the prophets and Psalms about himself for 40 days in multiple locations, and multiple people, multiple times. It is beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have just an enormous treasure of eyewitness accounts that we can draw from. So Matthew and John are apostolic eyewitnesses. They wrote their Gospels. I'm a firm believer that Matthew wrote his gospel. <laughs> and Luke, what does Luke say? He, Luke says, I only get my information from eyewitnesses. I can trace eyewitnesses all the way back to the very birth of Christ. And he records for us in his gospel in the Acts of the Apostles firsthand experiences. And of course, Mark, we know from history, wrote down what Peter preached. So Mark is not creating a gospel, he's recording a gospel. He's a secretary for Peter. And who's a better eyewitness than Petey, <laughs> my bishop? Peter preaches that first sermon, what does he say? God's raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of the fact. Acts 2, 32. So there's nothing more essential to Christianity than the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Nothing more important to Christians to have reliable description of the resurrection events. And we have four of them in the Gospels. Not just one, not two, four. And those accounts come from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses, as we said. So, one, we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to testimony about the resurrection. But there's something called the criteria, criterion of embarrassment, which is the standard of embarrassment. It's like an expensive word. I just learned it recently in uh, going crazy over this whole issue. Access to so much new information. So what is this? So for this particular concept, the use of women as the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection in the four Gospels is an embarrassment, would have been an embarrassment, unless it is true, or unless it's a profound statement about the will of God, okay? We're going to check it out. What do you say? Yes, Let's go. So there's critics, obviously, of the Bible, as there always has been from the very beginning and always will be. We don't care. You got a piece of paper? Go use it. The porta potty Okay? The blue one. So apparently the theory is that the Gospels are legends. They're created by the geniuses, fishermen, okay? The smartest guys in the world to produce this incredible story that's captured the hearts of billions of people all over the globe, okay? Uh, the, they propagate this false religion. However, it's illogical in a culture such as theirs that marginalizes women to actually choose women as the primary eyewitnesses of the very foundational events of Christianity. The inclusion of women as eyewitnesses in all four accounts can only be explained as an accurate historical record of the events themselves. So now, back in the late 1900s, I was riding my stagecoach to Bible college. 
feels that way sometimes. <laughs> I was doing my master's thesis on what is now Vanguard University in Costa Mesa, and I chose for my top. I got a thesis, I got to graduate. I was in the nine-year MA program, <laughs> strung this thing along forever and ever. Uh, and I, I got to the end of it. I needed a thesis. I needed to, to graduate. And I said, yeah, I'm going to choose this topic. I'm going to choose to explore the issue of women and their potential for Christian ministry from the scripture. I'd already done enormous research on the subject of women from a Pentecostal perspective at undergraduate and graduate level. So I said, this is going to be easy. This is going to be simple. I already had so many pages, so much research. But I was so wrong. <laughs> Ended up becoming an extremely challenging nightmare. There's so much controversy over a woman's place in the church still to this day it's incredible and so in the course of wandering through the swamp of endless scholarship i discovered a huge flaw in the interpretation process it glosses over the incredibly radical uh, inclusion of women by jesus and it also ignores the power of the holy spirit to do whatever he wants with his vessel it's not my will, but yours be done. Can we let God be God? Yeah. <laughs> Do whatever you will, Lord. Come on. So the Holy Spirit is for all nations, for all people, tribes, language, tongues, male, female, sons, daughters, young and old, slaves, bond and free, male and female. Who does that include? Everybody. That was just about to cover everybody. <laughs> I think all flesh covers you all. <sighs> all right. So I discovered that the popular theology of female subjection was largely due to male bias that gets dressed up in religion. It still does. It's got big robes. It's fancy. It's got big sticks and does all kinds of hats and does things. You know what I'm saying? The bigger the, the noise, you know, the, the more authority you have. Anyway, we live in a broken world. What do you say? What happened? The world in which we live is fragmented. It is shattered. It's tarnished by the fall of Adam and Eve. The entry of Satan into the world. We cannot possibly believe that the world as we see it now is actually the world that God created. Okay? Anyone who looks out the world right now goes, man, there's a problem. And that didn't come from God. Okay? God is good. God is love. God is gracious. We can also see that. But we also see that the world has a problem. Death, sickness, poverty, war, famine, hatred, polytheism, demonism, lying, stealing, sexual immorality, oppression, slavery. Just a few of demonic characteristics of a broken world. Most of our pain comes from this dysfunction and brokenness that we carry around with us. So we live in a shattered ruins of the fall. Do I have another one? Hopefully so. So as a consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden, our primordial parents, sin, Satan, his evil entourage of demons entered God's good world, and all they do all day is try to mess it up. What do you, what do you say? Every part of it is impacted. So since we live outside the Garden of Eden, since we live in this ruined uh, state of ruin, our perception of reality and our theologies are distorted, refracted, and obscured by the brokenness. There's no way around it. We live in it. We're, we don't even understand what it would have been like to be in the original setting of the garden and walk with God every day. Not so anymore. So because of that, we need to be very careful about how we view things because we are over here in the burnt down, shattered ruins of civilization that's been impacted negatively. So all of this stratification and fragmentation results of the fall and 
Just like everything else, women are a part of that intrusion of evil. They are victims just like anybody else because this evil became embedded in, in civilization as a cultural tradition. But none of that is based on Christ and none of it's based on God's original intent for humanity. We have to get a hold of that and understand this thing. So for me, back in my day, I thought, what would happen if we only followed the example of Jesus? Right? Instead of commentaries, which are important, i got tons of them, right? What would happen if we looked at the example of Christ and his treatment of women and how that transferred to the earliest apostolic church through the power of of the Holy Spirit. So, I have it here, my thesis, look at that. I haven't touched this in so long, it's hard to find it. <laughs> but uh, here it is. It's called Jesus Pentecost and Women in Ministry. So I was reading through and I go, you know, this is still pretty good. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll have to go through and clean it up a little bit, but you know, everything in here is still well researched and valid for today. So the reason I took Jesus and Pentecost is because I absolutely feel, especially on this issue, that Jesus is completely ignored, and we ignore the power of the Holy Spirit. We go straight from Judaism in the synagogue right to structure for the church, which is the problem. So if we're merciless in following Christ, and if we're able to confront exactly what he's trying to show us, then that could change the way we think about a lot of things. Hasn't it already impacted you? Your thought process? It should, because you should be what? Renewing your mind. <laughs> so, Jesus is our only example for everything. Who else do we want to follow as Christians? Huh? We're followers of Christ. So, uh, 25 years ago, when I was doing this, there wasn't much research available on the woman's issue. There were usual diatribes, because back in those days, very popular, just theology of restriction and silence, and women can't do this and can't do that, you know, and women not allowed in the men's club. And so I actually went to Foursquare, because Foursquare was founded by a woman, and I thought they certainly should have some policy on this thing well established. So I called them up and I said, hey, what do you got? I'm doing this research project. You know, we don't actually have anything. You know, Amy. What, you got Amy? Yeah. You mean you don't have anything well thought out by one of the theologians in your denomination? That would have anything. So it forced Jack Hayford to produce something, which is all right, but, you know, it was, not, it was okay. It's okay. <laughs> Assemblies of God had a little something. It was fairly decent. But uh, there wasn't a lot of good theological work being done from a strictly biblical point of view. Okay, you can find secular points of view or philosophical points of view, secular point, progressive nonsense, right? None of that. We don't want any of that. We want it from the lips of Jesus. And we want it from the New Testament with Jesus as a lens and the Holy Spirit as the other one through which we look at this important issue. So some of the things that I researched a long time ago, really hard to find out, and were, were new to me. So it could be old stuff, but still, it was new to me back in those days. And it's still worth the effort, and so much work done on it. So that's why we get to this fancy word called the criterion of embarrassment. Do I have it? No. So, which is a proof of the resurrection. So we're going to look at this special piece of evidence for the resurrection, which is the evidence of the women. It's a little bit of evidence that often goes overlooked and ignored. Not among us, because huh? we appreciate Jesus here, do we not? Absolutely. We're not afraid to follow Jesus. We're not afraid to look at him and go, that makes me extremely uncomfortable. That's very embarrassing. But you are the way, the truth, and the life. Where you lead, I'm going. Amen. Okay? Pick up my cross, and here we go. So the inclusion of women at the beginning of the resurrection story is proof of the accuracy of the story. That's the point, ladies and gentlemen. And we know that God is a God of reason, is he not? 
And God is sovereign, isn't he? Everybody believes that, just not like other people. But if we believe God is sovereign, then God's choice of women as the first eyewitnesses is the sovereign will of God, which means it's an important lesson to be learned here. Come on. So the inclusion of women as the first eyewitnesses is a significant piece of evidence for the proof of the resurrection. Because Jesus chose to reveal himself first to his female disciples. Why not? They've been following since the beginning of his ministry. They came all the way down with him. They were at his cross. They were at his burial. They were at his resurrection. Why not? Ladies first, somebody <laughs> said. <laughs> all right, here we go. So we all know in all Gospels, Jesus appears to the ladies. And we have them listed by name in the canon of Scripture, which in and of itself is significant for the ancient times in which they lived, when women were invisible. But how now here they're highly visible, okay, by name in Scripture. This is the Jerusalem women's ministry. So they went very early to the tomb, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James. And how many? What? Other women. How many, how many women were disciples of Jesus Christ? Lots of them. Okay? Actual traveling missionaries, trainees in the Bible Academy, along with the apostles. Okay? These guys are apostles, but among this group is this large entourage of faithful, godly, good Holy women. All right? Mary Magdalene again, Mary the mother of James, Salome, brought spices. They're going to come and anoint him. So this is the full spectrum of womanhood represented here. You got Mary Magdalene, sing single. Uh, the other Mary is probably a widow, the mother of two apostles. Uh, Salome is Mary, mother of James and John, Zebedee. That'd be a great name for a kid, wouldn't it? Call him Zeb. Hey, Zeb, sons of thunder. Those are the two boys. Joanna is the wife of Chusa, who is the head of Herod's household. So she left considerable luxury to walk in the dirt and camp out with Jesus, which has got to be an incredible switch and change for her life. What a transformation. You know, she comes from servants, and everybody do whatever you want, live in the palace, marble, everything in those days, snapping your fingers to being a servant. Can you imagine? What a significant change for her. So all of these ladies were the first to be honored by Jesus in his long series of post-resurrection experiences. Ladies... Christianity acknowledges their existence and raises them from the mindless, subservient position which she occupied both in Judea, uh, Judaism and in polytheistic culture, universally. Come on. So what does Jesus do? Makes women equal heirs of salvation. <laughs> right? There's not a pink salvation and a blue salvation. <laughs> we are all sons of God in Christ, are we not? So... This high visibility given to women and their participation in the life and ministry of Jesus is valuable lessons for us today. Wouldn't it be? Should it be? Should be. So the New Testament recognizes many women by name, which is unusual, and they provide, the Gospels provide insight into Jesus' radical inclusion of women. Now, it is universally acknowledged that the inclusion of women by Jesus Christ is extraordinary. It's counter to all religious and cultural traditions. Everyone will agree with that. Okay, You read it and you go, yeah, Jesus was radical in his inclusion of women. No rabbi would do that. No philosopher would do that. Nobody in all the world would do that. Why did Jesus do that? Because he's making a statement. He's God come in human flesh. He's not just a philosopher, some poet, some minor guy. You know, he is the example for us. And he's doing something by including, uh, as his disciples, the low, the weak, and the subordinate, and giving them a position in his traveling community as equal parties to this joint effort they're involved in. So 
uh, their roles, their contributions, their encounters with Jesus are highlighted. Now, what happens is, even though scholars will recognize the radical nature of Jesus in this, they won't follow it to its radical conclusion. Today, the church looks exactly like it would have 2,000 years ago. It ignores Jesus. This is my point. So if we follow Jesus and we acknowledge that this is radical, this is contrary to their religious practices and their cultural practices, this deeply embedded uh, root that's been in civilization since the dawn of time, <laughs> then Jesus is not just an anomaly or a passing whim or prophet. He's the Son of God. I will build my church. How do all my church build? Like this. Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. <sighs> so, this challenges the religious and social norms of his time, and it's offering what? A different model. A model of equality and dignity. Whew. So, what? What's the big deal? The big deal is that because of the cultural the background, using women or calling women or allowing women to be the first witnesses of the resurrection is an amazing proof of the resurrection itself. Okay? Women were considered to be inferior. They're unreliable. They're not allowed to give testimony in a court of law. They didn't, they didn't count. Women did not count. So if you want to start a synagogue, you needed 10 men. You could have a thousand holy women. No, it's not going to count. You can't have a synagogue unless you have 10 men to start a synagogue. Even in the counts of the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, what did they say? There are 5,000 men. 4,000 men. It's like what? No women and children there? Women and children don't count here? So in terms of cultural norms in ancient Israel and in most ancient cultures, there are very strict gender roles and social expectations regarding men and women and interactions between men and women. Men did not engage in conversations with women in public settings. Very rarely would they, women were not allowed to be taught in terms of Jewish uh, religious customs and traditions, emphasize strict separation, which they still do to this day. Weren't we just there? Huh? Yeah. And what did we see when we were just there at the wall in Jerusalem last year, about this time? Women are over there, big wall, men are over here, right? When we went underneath that little tunnel, who was in there? Only men were in there. Only men had access to the holy books. So, still to this very day, not only in Judaism, but also in Christianity, there's huge separations due to theology and customs and cultures, especially in those particular days. So, here's some of the things. Women were not allowed to learn the Torah, which is a scripture. They were not taught that. They were not allowed to be educated, not allowed to speak in the temple, or read in the synagogue, pray publicly. There were absolutely no leadership positions available to women. They had a theology of inferiority that they got from rabbinical law that was passed on to many Christian theologians, like a plague. Uh, they're not allowed to say benediction after meals. They're considered to be the originators of sin, death, and suffering in the Garden of Eden. Um, wasn't Adam there? Uh, talking to a woman was dangerous. Walking behind a woman was dangerous. Women were not allowed public conversations, not allowed to question husbands in public. I kind of like that one. <laughs> Categorized with Gentiles, slaves, children, imbeciles, and property. Okay, come here, my little imbecile. So, <laughs> this is just a small list. Just a small list. There's more. Wait, there's more. Of constraints imposed on women during this time. And this is proven by anthropological studies, a new field, basically. But it's a prevailing cultural pattern. Women are regarded as insignificant, inferior, subordinate excluded from public and religious leadership roles. So, considering the negative portrayal of women during this time, it would be unthinkable, all that to say, 
It would be unthinkable for anyone to fabricate a resurrection narrative and feature women as the primary witnesses of our most crucial doctrine. <sighs> what? There's more. I told you there's more. No credibility. Yeah, so the, the big one is they had no, they're not considered credible witnesses. Completely separated. All right. So, if the apostles were going to fabricate as critics say they did, one, I don't believe they're smart enough to do it, and two, uh, they would not have begun with the testimony of women in terms of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only reason to include women in the picture is it was true. It's an accurate account. So, to include women at this point in the development of the Christian church would be unnecessary. It's unnecessary to do that. It's uncalled for, and it would be an embarrassment to everybody involved, as it still is today in many places, and ignored and still is marginalized. Yeah, you can go to church your whole life, never heard a sermon like this. So Christianity is already controversial enough as it is, it's already disliked you know, for a lot of other reasons, and this could be another reason for that. So no one at that time could even believe that the testimony of women were essential to the story because it was worthless. So oh, we, we, they're a part of cr this legend creating this super messianic Christ that we find in the New Testament. The, the Christ of the, the apostolic church is not the Christ of history. Who, what? You go take that paper and go do whatever you need to do with it. Go do, do somewhere else, but not here. <laughs> so what we have here is the disciples' dedication to accuracy to the extent that they're going to report the historic uh, events as they took place. If their primary concern was to create an appealing story to be able to market to their Jewish audience, they would never have done this. <sighs> this is extreme evidence for the reliability of the text. All right, so if Scripture is our guide, how many say yes? yes? Then we can see the instantaneous effects of this Easter model. Okay, The first people to learn of the resurrection, women. The first Easter messengers were women. The first to see Jesus, women. All right? Unbelievable. Now, the fact that Jesus only chose 12 Jewish men, which is both ethnocentric and androcentric, prior to Easter does not mean that Jesus will only use 12 Jewish men after Easter. All right? These, these guys will go, oh, Jesus only picked men. Yeah, they had beards and wore sandals and things like that, too. What about that? <laughs> is, is, so this is the only 12 that Jesus will ever choose to follow him after Pentecost? Or is Pentecost for all flesh, sons and daughters, young and old, bond and free? It's total access to the globe, to the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is another lens and extremely important in this whole conversation. Something happened at the cross. It's finished. And now what? New beginning. What does new look like? It looks like new. <laughs> Doesn't look like old. Okay? It's brand new. Old, new. They're not the same thing. <sighs> Can't use that as a, an example. So the angel appears to the women and says, don't be afraid. Now, why would they be afraid? <laughs> well, first there's angels there, and uh, the tomb is empty, and I would be afraid too. Uh, go, the, the angels say, I know you seek Jesus crucified. He's not here. He's risen. As he, as he said, <laughs> we've been looking at that for weeks. So you can go back and check him out online. Uh, come and look. Hey, welcome. Come on in. And then go tell his disciples he's risen from the dead. and He's going to go to Galilee and see you, see you up there. He'll check in with you later. So the angels were excited about the resurrection, right? They've also been waiting for this as much as anybody else. And they're sharing it with the women, and the women are commanded to go tell the disciples. Who are the disciples? 
the men and the other ladies. Okay, there's more involved here, but primarily he's talking about the guys hiding out in the, in the secret place, right? Go tell his disciples. So the angel didn't say to the women, you know, you're forbidden to speak. You can't be trusted with this information. Could you go get Peter and John and tell them to come here so I can tell them that Jesus has been raised from the dead and then they will go tell the men? No. The women were not forbidden, restricted, limited, banned, silenced, or lectured about. Male handship. <laughs> Submission. The order of creation. All male eldership. Gender distinctions. Male female roles. The angel said what? Go <laughs> and tell them that he's risen from the dead. Go, ladies. <laughs> and so they went. Go and tell them. Come on. What is it about go that looks like stop? G-O is not S-T-O-P. So they went quickly. They're all happy. Great joy. Matthew 28, 8. Going to bring the word. They're going to bring the word. What kind of word? The most important word in all Christianity. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Look at them. All happy. This is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. They couldn't believe that the angel had entrusted them with such an important mission. First, they're shocked. Wait, you talking to us? And then it's like, wait, you, you want us to go do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> and the, the cool thing about it is they met Jesus along the way. So Jesus met them and saying, hey, rejoice, be happy. So they came and held him at, uh, by his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus says what? Don't be afraid anymore. Ladies, don't be afraid anymore, okay? Do not be afraid anymore of what men tell you. Why would they be afraid? They'd be afraid for a lot of reasons. Who, did, who would they fear? Who would they be afraid of? Jewish authorities. They'd be afraid of men, right? He's Jesus along the way. Where is it? Right here. Who they fear? Well, they feared men. They feared tradition. They feared uh, religious in, uh, restrictions, wouldn't they? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. We've never been allowed to do anything like this. We're not supposed to do stuff like this. But, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, you, put them, you put them in a, in a quandary here about should they follow all the rituals and stuff that they've been raised in Judaism their, and their culture their whole lives or go do what the angel told them to do. They were taught to fear, raised in fear, controlled by fear. They feared talking to men. They feared what men would say and do. Uh, they feared mocking and ridicule, rejection. They feared being silenced, belittled, and dismissed. All of the above. And yet their fears are overcome by the Easter mandate. What's that? The Easter mandate. Go and tell them about the resurrection. So this doctrine, this theological doctrine, this cultural doctrine of the inferiority of women that's embedded in religion is not embedded in Christ. Are you excited about that? If we face this as we should, we can see the traumatic impact, the immediate change that Jesus provides. Now, check this out for me. You ready? Do I have it? Uh, well, you know, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to one of these. So if you think about Christ-likeness, born in a stable, born to peasants, he's the little... Uh, sprout from Isaiah 53, despised, rejected, you know, of meager parentage, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody would look at him and go, oh, you're, you got to be the Messiah. Okay, from Isaiah 53, we look at that recently. So what does Jesus do? He appears to the lowest, the worthless, those who don't count, the least and the last. Jesus appears to the second order of creation. Oh, women are created second because they're secondary. What? 
the subjective, the submissive, the silence, the help meet, the subordinate, the unteachable, the inferior, the curse, the easy portals of heresies. These are all quotes. It's so Christ-like for Jesus to treat and honor and show dignity to his female disciples that gave up so much to follow him. Amen. So much. To his lowly female disciples disciples. It's so like Christ to honor these humble, invisible, broken-hearted witnesses who watched him suffer and die on the cross, who carried his body to the grave, who came to anoint him with their, their uh, wrappings to be the eyewitnesses of his resurrection glory. Come on. Jesus is the founder and the Lord of the church. <laughs> We should follow his example, okay? So, when was the last time your theology brought any joy to women, okay? When was the last time your theology, your theology brought inclusion to women and allowed them to bring the word <laughs> to holy men? Whew, men are so great. They're so awesome. So the representation of women in the resurrection account, as far as the heavy lifters are concerned, is proof of the resurrection and the historicity of it. But it also represents Jesus' revolutionary teachings and incorporation of gender equality and inclusion. We, we have to understand that. We have to agree with that. We're not. So... Uh, those treated as last will now be the first in the new Christian era. He appeared to women as a statement. It's, a, it's on purpose. <laughs> he has a purpose for this. There's a new redemptive era that begun, and, and he wants women radically incorporated. What does that mean? You're free to serve God as God chooses to use you. Okay? Be free to serve God as God chooses to use you. So the life of Jesus should inspire us to value one another more, right? We value each other, regardless of large or small or, you know, what we can possibly contribute. We all have something to contribute. We all can at some level. I don't have to be Billy Graham, do I? I will never be him, right? <laughs> but Jesus acknowledged and actively involved women as disciples. They were his financial supporters. They were witnesses to key events. And this is a shift in perspective, emphasizing the value and freedom of women to pursue dreams and aspirations and, and to grow spiritually and to be able to serve God with holy, godly lives, okay, as you represent the character of Christ. So by following Jesus, believers can model for a broken world, a refuge where individuals, regardless of your gender, age, color, ethnicity, social status, can be honored and respected and given opportunities to learn and to grow and to serve God with your God-given potential. We all have potential. Those who were relegated to carrying wood and water were now entrusted to carry the Word of God. So we want to embrace this, if we possibly can, it's Easter. Uh, embrace the Jesus consistently treated women with respect, dignity, and equality. We have to say that is an absolute fact. No one like him. How is different, Jesus different than other religious leaders right here? How is Christianity unique among all religions of the world right here? How does Jesus raise the quality of life right here? Okay. This alone should tell you that Jesus is magnificent. There's none like him. His empowerment of leadership. He entrusted women with significant roles in his ministry. 
to serve as leaders, witnesses, to be able to learn the Torah from the author of the Torah. (laughs) And to be major contributors. And Jesus, of course, spoke out against all forms of injustice and oppression, and this is one form of that. Uh, The disenfranchised included women in that. What's Jesus? Compassion, mercy, love. (laughs) Should inspire us to work together for a more just and equitable society. Can I get amen there? Jesus modeled respectful, pure, and compassionate interactions with women. Was was his interactions with women pure? 100%. 100%. We're not worried about him having illicit offspring with Mary Magdalene. Ridiculous. Oh, come on. Blasphemy, right? Jesus is the pinnacle of holiness. The women who followed him gave up lives of sin to follow him in moral purity and to learn the word of God and walk before God in righteousness. This is a group of people struggling to serve God in a holy manner. He challenged the religious and cultural attitudes that objectified and demeaned women, and he is our example, isn't he? Women are much more than just object of male male attention. He calls men and male leadership to cultivate a culture of respect, honor, and dignity towards all women and to recognize their inherent value as fellow image bearers of God. And Jesus encouraged women to pursue their dreams, passions, and callings, which wasn't extremely easy in those days and probably just as difficult today in many places. So Jesus, revolutionary teachings, his actions in the Gospels demonstrates a commitment, right? A commitment that he made to reconciliation of people to to himself. And it challenges us, shouldn't it? To re-examine our attitudes, our own behaviors, towards one another, towards different ethnic groups, towards cross-cultural missions, towards the poor, towards the weak, towards women, children. What should it be? (laughs) We should uh, allow people to embrace their God-given value and help them to pursue their dreams and aspirations. Because why? The cross is a triumph over the demonic. The triumph extends to female disciples of Jesus Christ. So the criterion of embarrassment, probably have to spend a lot of money to learn that. Jesus isn't embarrassed, is he? Don't apply to him. No, he's not embarrassed. An approved woman is not ashamed, okay? Nothing to be ashamed of, ladies. There is no condemnation to those who belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? Now, you may keep condemnation on yourself like we all do. We're all capable of doing that. We have to struggle with that all the time. But this is not one thing that you should struggle with. You should be happy. You should rejoice before God that he created you to be a woman, the one gender in the whole planet that has the magnificent capability that you have. Okay? There's no condemnation. And so we want to celebrate the resurrection. We want to celebrate Easter every day and the power that raised Christ from the dead. What do you say? Let's do it. Let's stand, shall we? Let's stand together. Let's get our worship team up here and call down the fire god or something (laughs) let's pray father we just thank you just begin to pray right now lord we rejoice in you we're thankful for your word to us we're grateful for your example (sighs) lord we call you lord we want to follow you we believe that you came you took on human nature that you crucified it on the cross along with all of our sins, that we might live for righteousness. We pray, God, that we would be more mindful of just how important you are, not only 
in our individual lives, but in our corporate lives. And I pray, Father, as we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, that we'd be able to work arm in arm to advance your kingdom in our generation. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. He's worthy, isn't he? All right. Let's worship Jesus. Is 
standing on his throne Prepare the place that I call my own There I will see him face to face The white bed and tear from my face Joy, this is the joy of the Lord my strength. Can we rejoice in Jesus today? Can we lay it all down, give it all to Him? Why not? Let's pray, shall we? Father, we do thank You for the joy that we have in You. Lord, when this world crumbles around us, we come to You, we stand before You, we come to Your throne. We can receive grace and mercy and joy, Lord, in time of need. And Lord, we just thank You for showing us the way bringing us back to the Father. We pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, even today, you would help us to be witnesses of your resurrection. We thank you for the breakwater. We thank you for what you're able to make happen through us. We pray for more, Lord. We pray that you'd increase us, our ability to serve you in our generation. We pray for Bibles. We pray for water wells we pray for missions we pray for local outreach lord jesus in our work and in our uh, recreation in our arenas and our families in our church we also pray lord that by the mighty arm of god you would extend us to the nations and continue to use us in jesus name Amen. amen All right. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Uh, If you'd like to participate in helping us stay afloat, it's called Tithe and Offerings right here. If you want to participate in our Africa outreaches, you can do 